it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 147 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we are drinking one of my absolute favorites, the Kenyan coffee. You love that Kenyan coffee. I do. It's delicious and yummy. And where can everybody get theirs? Phantomroasters.com. And follow them on social media. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing today? I'm loving the cooler weather. How are you doing? It's pretty cool out there. Hot in the sun, but you get in the shade, you're good. Well, early morning is so delightfully cool. I just love it. The animals love it. We had a major thunderstorm over here overnight in which in the middle of the night, they sent a tornado warning. Wow. And the only one who heard it was Ella. And she looked at it and says, well, it's just a warning. I'm going to go back to sleep and did not alert the family. So thank goodness there was not a real tornado. Because I told her, I was like, if you're awake and you see a warning, you should wake us up so we can go to the basement. And she was like, ah, it was just a warning. (laughs) Just a warning. It's fine. The really funny thing is the storm went right below us and we didn't get any of it. It was a lot of rain. So we emptied the bowls every night for the water for the chickens. When I went out there this morning, they were like over half full again. Wow. That's a couple of inches. I know. And it was windy and the lightning, and thank God we weren't like Dorothy and up in a tornado. That was good, you know? Considering the fact that we just had a tornado here a few weeks back. Yeah. I'm glad you were spared that. We had some drizzle. (laughs) That was it. We had some drizzle. We heard some thunder in the distance, but that was it. That was all. Oh, I want to give a shout out to my uncle. He came to visit me yesterday. This is my mom's brother, my uncle Sal. We had such a fun conversation yesterday. Plus, he helped me try to find an earring that went missing in my yard. So he had his metal detector and he was looking all over the yard for the earring. We did not find it yet. Oh, man. So I told him he has to come back again. But we had some really good conversations. And I love it when he comes to visit me because he loves coffee. He loves it. Nice. Multiple cups of coffee conversations. I was talking to him about my great-grandfather who mm-hmm. had all the chickens. Right. And because he was Uncle Sal grew up on the chicken farm with your mother. Yes. And sometimes I like talking to him and my mom because they have different memories. Yeah. So he was telling me that there was all leghorns on the farm except for their little coop that they had and that they had Rhode Island Reds, leghorns, and Plymouth Bard Rocks, which I did not know. Oh, so neat. that's pretty cool. I found out yesterday that my grandfather, my great grandfather, actually, was known as the Egg Man of Baltimore's Little Italy. Oh, that's cool. I was like, that is so I love cool. That. I love that. It makes that. sense, too, because if you think, if you went up back River Neck Road and turned on Eastern Avenue, you would take Eastern Avenue all the way into Baltimore City. So to it makes Italy. perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. Very so, cool. My uncle told me that he would take all the eggs, that him and my great-grandmother would get the eggs, they would wash them, get them all taken care of, candle them and everything, and then load the car up and drive to Little Italy and sell all the eggs. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. I said, well, it's in my blood. Where did they sell? Did they have like a little booth somewhere or did they go door to door? I think they sold out of the car. Like they just drove around and sold the eggs to everybody. Wow. Like, they were that? known. He was known as the like, here egg comes man. the egg man. Yeah. Eggman's coming. Get the yeah. get the money out. Yeah. Exactly. I That's thought that was cool. cool. 
I love yeah, that. Yeah, that was cool. So it was nice to visit with him last night. He has to come back and again look for the earring, but hopefully yes. maybe one day we'll find it. I hope so. How's everything on your end? We're good. We are starting to do some fall cleanup already. I, I feel like whew, September was going on a flash. It's and going. We're, <laughs> we're really getting into fall. We're getting another shed to move all of the animal stuff out of the garage. That's exciting. In, yeah, into a shed. Yeah, so we've been looking at them and having some landscape work done to accommodate the shed. That is to be continued, but that's going to be ground zero for farm operations around here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button for two reasons. The first is you never miss an episode. And the second is it's another really great, easy way to help the show grow. If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. 5,000. You can check out our Etsy shop, see what mugs and t-shirts we have up, see if we have any more little chickens in stock. We're updating regularly. Oh, yeah. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership and see if that's something you would like to do. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website, and our show notes. Use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good-smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Dum, 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 dum. It's time for the breed spotlight, yeah. Yeah. That sounded like the opening for the Muppets for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to just, I would never plan anything. It's just whatever I feel like at the moment, you know? Spontaneous, yes. Yes. And this week's breed spotlight is? The Austra White. And this is a breed spotlight for one of our gorgeous patrons, Tashina. Yeah, Tashina has the Austra Whites. She loves them. And I realized I didn't really know a whole lot about them. So we thought, why not? Let's do a breed spotlight. And they are kind of interesting because the Austro White, it's a very early hybrid variety. Okay. They were developed somewhere in the 1920s or the 1930s by Dunlop Hatchery in Junction City, Oregon. There's a new one that we haven't heard of yet. Right. They're still a smaller hatchery. And we'll talk more about them as we go on. But because this is so early in the history of hybrids, this is like hybridizing in the non-industrial way, if that makes sense. Right. So it's a little closer to a heritage breed than than just a hybrid it out is of a company. It's a direct product. 
It is a direct product of a heritage breed without a lot of engineering going on in the background. Right. So the Dunlop family, who owned Dunlop Hatchery in Junction City, Oregon, they later moved the hatchery to Caldwell, Idaho in the 1940s. It is still there. Okay. It is still the same company, still the same family. Now, it doesn't look like the Dunlaps trademarked the name Austra White because there are other hatcheries using the name as well. I found some others using it. Okay. Is it the same type of bird, though? Yeah. Yeah. Same bird. Okay. This may have been the case with earlier hybrid layers in general because I don't know that these hatcheries were trademarking anything at that point. They were a little naive to it and not aware that people are going to copy off of you and do other things. That happens in the world. Now, it was 1918 when Oscar Dunlap started the hatchery. He wanted to create a laying hen that had the leghorn's productivity mixed with the Australorp's calm and friendly Demeter. And that sounds like a really nice bird. Oh, yeah, for sure. Plus, the Australorps aren't exactly slackers in the egg department. They're really good layers. So Oscar crossed a white leghorn hen with an Australorp rooster. And the result was exactly what he wanted. It was a calm and friendly bird that laid a lot of eggs. The Dunlops sold the chicks as well as pullets. And it's easy to imagine that these very pretty and very productive hens would have been super popular, especially at point of lay. Right. People Definitely. could bring them in and have eggs, you know, in a matter of weeks rather than waiting months from hatch. Exactly. I mean, sometimes people don't want the chicks and they want the point of lay and that's this chicken's going to be ready to go at point of lay. That's for right. sure. Now, because these birds are hybrids, they will not breed true if crossed. That's always the definition of a hybrid. The parentage is directly from the two heritage breeds. Each generation has to come from a leghorn hen and an Australop brew in order to create the Austral white. Right. And as we said, they're early hybrids. And because they weren't engineered by a genetics company, they do tend to live a longer and healthier life than most of the modern hybrid super laying hens. It might be a good in-between bird for people who really want a hybrid for that egg laying ability. Right. But a longer life is always a good thing. And this one does, this bird does seem to give a longer life. So it might be a good middle ground. There are, I find it hard to believe because I love all the chicken personalities, but I know there are people who just are irritated by the leghorn and some of the Mediterraneans, their reactiveness, the fact that they will take off in flight, you know, things like that. And it sounded like that's exactly what Dunlop wanted. He wanted the laying of the leghorn, but he really did not want to deal with all the flightiness. Right. I mean, a lot of people don't really like the leghorn. We are the, ex we're one of the exceptions. We love, love, love the leghorns. Yeah. And, you know, it's really hard for me to imagine why you don't love a leghorn, but they're used in so many, they're the foundation bird of so many right. different birds that right. in a way it does show a love for the breed and what they give. And they try to change it up and take out the personality. Right. The reality is the leghorn is an awesome bird on its own and mixed with another bird. They do give that egg laying super bird kind right. of I way. Mean, and the Austro White is two really amazing heritage breeds. It really is. And like you're saying, it might be a good in-between bird for someone who's looking for a super layer that doesn't necessarily want the leghorn. Maybe they want a bird that's a little more cold hardy or they just want a bird that's a little calmer. Although again, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Now, but. also keep in mind that the Astrolop also has high egg laying ability. Yeah, so, I said that in the introduction. Yeah, they are not a slouch. So, right. So you got two super birds here and that's yeah. why it's good. So let's go into what they're going to look like for you. So the Austro White is, it's a medium sized birds with the ruse weighing in at about six to six and a half pounds and the hens at about five pounds. That is your classification of a true medium sized bird when the roosters are only about six, six and a half. That's right. a medium. It's, it's definitely bigger. They have got a whole pound at least on the leghorn. Oh, yeah. I mean, because yeah. the leghorn roos are about four and a half to five, five, right. five and a half. Yeah. Right. Okay. So these birds are white with random black speckles and small spots on their feathers. So they're really gorgeous little birds. Mm -hmm. It's very pretty, kind of like a sort of a subtle kind of splash. It's not huge spots. They're smaller spots. It's, it's very pretty. I know. Tashina loves hers. Mm -hmm. She is always talking about hers. So they're white. 
And splash coloring is a result of the white and black genetics. And this is one place where the hybrids come in as a really pretty bird. So they have medium to large coma waddles, white earlobes, so hint, hint, <laughs> and either yellow or slate legs. So it's kind of like that grab bag chicken. You don't know what you're going to get till you get them. Right. And a few of the hens have a bit of a floppy comb, which is so cute from both breeds can have larger size combs. I think you're definitely getting some leg horn when you get that flop. That's a Mediterranean comb flop in there. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Now, we're going to get you off the charts with these numbers for the hen's laying abilities. They yeah. lay around 250 to 300 off-white or cream-colored eggs per year. That's pretty good. That's a lot of eggs. And, and you know, like we said, they are healthier than most of the modern industrially engineered hybrids. So. If I had to have a hybrid, this is probably the bird I would get. I think me too. I mean, it seems like a healthier bird. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Now, we saw a handful of the hatcheries say that these hens do not go broody, which for me would be another check mark. But, I don't want mine going broody. But there's equal numbers of keepers saying their hens do go broody. Well, they've got 50% Australorp genetics. Which have so, Buff Orpington in them. Well, so right. We so that birdie's there. Yeah. I mean, just remember that the Orpington is the great grandmother of the Ostra White. And that is some super, super broody DNA from your Orpingtons. So you got to hope that the broodiness comes in from the Leghorn and not the <laughs> Orpington. Because the Leghorn is the epitome of jump in the box, lay the egg, and jump I out and never look back. When you think about those two breeds, really, I mean, the Leghorn is probably the least broody hen I've ever seen. And the Orpingtons are one of the most broody, or the Australorps too. Lucy, every morning, it's just like, okay, got to lay the egg, boop, lay the egg out. <laughs> okay, food. I wish everyone could have seen your little body language when you did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it's done. She's just it's like, done. and then she doesn't ever want to go back in that box again. It's great. She's just like, I'm done. My it's business is finished. I'm finished with the box. I'm out of here. Yeah, exactly. So if you're not looking to breed and you're willing to order new birds every year, we do think they make a great homestead breed. Oh, yeah, for sure. They're dual purpose. They're great layers. They may be able to hatch eggs for you, depending on whether they can broody or not. They're great companions and pets. They're gentle enough for kids and families. They're healthy, and all reports say that they're tolerant of most temperature ranges. Kind of where you get that medium-sized bird, they're a little of both. Where it comes in is if they have a bigger comb and waddles, those are going to need to be protected. All skin is going to need to be protected against yeah. the cold. The other thing is, again, on the other side, they're medium birds, so they don't have a lot of that fluff. They have some from the Astralorp, but, you know... It's a mix. Leghorns right. are little with not a lot of fluff. Yeah. So you got to keep in mind those two birds and where they sit. So it is, you know, a happy medium. Yeah. All reports say that these are smart birds. They love to help in the garden. But we have to give this caveat. Care should be taken when free ranging your Ostra Whites because they have that white chicken target on their backs. Like I mean, everything. all of them have it, but the white chicken is the worst. Everything, especially predators, aerial predators, hawks, etc., can see those white chickens from like a mile away. My coops are, everyone knows, at the back of my three acres of property. And I sit sometimes in my family room. It's at the back of my house. I have big windows all across the back. And I look and the first birds I see are Lucy and Rita because yeah. they're the white birds. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. So, Apple blossom sticks out and praline, the light Brahma, they stick out. They're the first ones that your eye goes to because they're so bright. And the hawks and everybody else, they're the first ones they're going to see too. So yeah. just have some, do some supervised free ranging for them. They'll love it. Lots of places they can take cover. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So here's the question. Drum roll, please. Da -da 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 -da. Where can you find the Ostra Whites? You can find yeah. the Ostra Whites at Dunlop Hatchery. They do still sell them. And you can that's kind of cool. Right? I thought it was neat. Like, you can go back to the source and buy them. You can also get them at Cackle Hatchery and My Pet Chicken. So My Pet Chicken would be nice because if you only want three birds, you right. can get three birds there. So these oh, places are great. That's a good point because I didn't check what the minimum was from Dunlop. So that's a very good point. 
I did a Google search and I found plenty of other breeders as well. But just a warning, most of them were already sold out of Austria Whites for 2023. So you probably want to get your order in at the end of this year or early in 2024. Do it, do it. Get your order in quick. They're so, nice little birds. The thing I like is that they're not too industrialized. They're not industrialized at all. Right. So they do mimic both the heritage and the hybrid. They're just in the middle. And I love the fact that they can live a little longer. There's nothing worse than losing your chickens early. Honestly, you get so attached to them. It's just, it breaks your heart. Well, Dr. So, Rebecca has said to us that all chickens are subject to reproductive cancer. Like it can happen in any breed. But for sure, it happens more in the hybrids. Yeah. So a, a hybrid like this, I think, if you're really, really after large numbers of eggs and you want a hybrid, this is a really good bird to check out. Okay. This brings us to this. If you have the Austrowites, put a story up, mention us in your story. We'll reshare it. And to Sheena, this, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Send us over some pictures. We'll put them up. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, Try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so are you ready to move on to main topic? Yeah. 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 This week's main topic is a big main topic and we're kind of putting it in now because of the timing. Right. And we're going to talk about natural versus chemical dewormers and kind of like the chicken poop and worms. It's not a very like, don't eat your lunch while you listen to this, but it is going to be <laughs> super helpful with the information that we're going right. to give you. And it's a hot topic right now. It really, really it is. is. It's a super hot topic and it needs scientific explanation on both sides because you can't form an effective treatment plan for your flock if you don't really understand what's going on. Right, exactly. So dewormers are classified as anthelmintics. Helminth, the middle of the word, means parasite. So anthelmintic literally means anti-parasite. Exactly. And how do chemical wormers work? They are usually broad spectrum, so they're targeting a large variety of parasites. They'll have a standard dose. They'll have standard frequency, and they've been developed with scientific information behind them. So the whole development of these various chemical anti-parasitics is documented. You can find the science behind them. Right. And we can even say, we can even take the word chemical out at this point and use pharmaceutical. You know, right, I mean, because right. they're, they're medical, they're a medicine. There's been a ton of research done into them, and it's scientifically backed that these kill the worms that they say they're going to kill in a timely fashion. And they get rid it's of actually, them. That's a very good point because the natural dewormers also have chemicals too. It's a chemical compound that you're getting from a plant. So right. I do think the pharmaceutical natural is probably good language for us to use going forward. I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the biggest issues with the pharmaceutical dewormers is that parasites can develop resistance to them. It is a huge problem in the U.S., especially in the U.S. South. And because of this, a lot of researchers are currently trying to understand the way that natural dewormers work and which forms, which strengths, dosing and frequency are necessary to be effective and safe. And so there is a huge body of studies starting to build about natural dewormers. I mean, if you look at it this way, natural dewormers are just a new way to look at 
pharmaceutical and dewormers. You're looking at new things that we can put together, like you said, to get a chemical reaction to take care of something else. Right. So the thing with the South is it's super warm all the time. And that promotes these growths. Like where we are, we have a cold winter that kills them all. Thank goodness. So, you know, it takes some of the the amount of them out of the environment over the winter Moisture. time. Moisture is another big factor. Yeah, exactly. So it's the resistance that is a problem with them. That's the number one problem. Yeah, it really is. Now, the natural dewormers, there are absolutely natural dewormers that can be used to treat your flock, but they generally have to be extracted and condensed to be effective. And we do not mean essential oils. Essential oils are way too strong to be used as dewormers for your chickens. Yes, exactly. But with the natural products, you need to understand the strengths and the dosing requirements because these substances can be toxic or have serious side effects. Just because something is natural doesn't mean it is 100% safe. I think that's a lot of the confusion here. A lot of people put the word natural and nature into it's always going to be good for you. But there are certain things, there are certain plants that a lot of shade plants that chickens can't eat. They're poisonous right. to them. Right. Just because it's natural, it's not always safe. And I love that saying that because it's a truth that it we all need to be aware of. Foxglove is a source of natural heart medicine in the form of digoxin. Digoxin is a very, very common heart medicine. Your dad's on it and my mom's on it. Again, it's very effective, but too much of it can kill. So you'll hear people saying foxglove is poisonous. Foxglove is not poisonous in the right strength and the right frequency, too much foxglove, absolutely toxic and toxic to your animals. And when you're on digoxin, you have to have levels checked periodically yep. to make sure that you're in the target area that you're medicating, that you're getting the right amount. Right. And that underscores how important it is to understand dosing in order to use natural dewormers effectively. We're going to talk about six substances that are often touted to be natural dewormers. These would be ones that actually have some effect there are some other things that people yell all the time you should use for natural dewormers that do nothing, but these six actually have some action that we'll talk about. And then I think at the end, we should mention probably the one big pharmaceutical one that everyone can use safely. Yeah. So number one, our first- Pumpkin seeds. <laughs> Pumpkin seeds. It's the number one thing you hear about all the time. Everyone says, in the fall- Give your chicken pumpkin seeds. It's going to be a natural dewormer. It does not work the way most people say. Pumpkin seeds can work mechanically to remove worms in the digestive tract. And that's because they're so fibrous. Right. But they need to be chopped up first in order to maximize that action. And again, that's not killing worms. That's just moving existing worms through the digestive tract. There is also a chemical compound in pumpkin seeds that has shown to be effective against some roundworms, so roundworms only, right. but it must be extracted first. So you must get it into tincture form. Very, very little research about this. There are a couple of studies. None of them that I can find are specifically for chickens. Right. So I feel like pumpkin seeds might have some more merit, but more research needs to be done there. And the thing is, okay, you can take the pumpkin seeds out of your pumpkin and feed them that way, but you also can buy them and they're not cheap. It's not yeah. like a cheap endeavor. And the other thing I want to mention is these are good for prophylactically giving, not treating so much a hardcore case. Next most common natural dewormer that you hear? Garlic. Garlic. Are these people Italian? Every Italian eats a ton of garlic. Garlic is delicious. Okay, now, so garlic, it may be effective. But the way it's administered does seem to matter. Now, a lot of people want to chop up garlic and put it in the water. Lots. In the majority of the studies that I read, chopped garlic, as in chopping the garlic into pieces and getting your chicken to eat a piece or several pieces of garlic, that is the only form that had an effect on existing parasite load. Garlic water, garlic powder, or even garlic extract did not substantially reduce parasite loads. Exactly. Knowing that you're putting it in the water, you're flavoring the water for them, but you're not taking care of worms. So the garlic extract did work as an effective preventative. So it is worth using as part of an overall health plan. But again, it will not kill an existing worm load. So prophylactically. So, and 
as of right now in these studies, I don't feel like there's enough evidence of exactly how much whole garlic or how much pieces of garlic you would need to feed each hen. There can be a toxic load of garlic. Oh, I've heard that also. Yes. So again, I feel like there needs to be more research here. But like pumpkin seeds, I mean, you can use them prophylactically and it's part of, you know, it's healthy for them. So right. Just exactly. don't, what we're saying is if you have a chicken with a, with a worm load, don't think that's going to save her. She right. needs to be treated pharmaceutically. So number three, diatomaceous earth. Okay. So studies have found that the feed supplemented with DE can have an overall positive effect on poultry health, right? But it does not kill a worm load. Right. And one of the reasons for that is that once diatomaceous earth is thoroughly moistened, it no longer is effective. Dry diatomaceous earth can help prevent external parasites. So, like you can mix it into a dust bath. Right. But again, don't rely on it to treat an existing worm load. The studies that I found, they didn't even say use it prophylactically internally. They essentially said it doesn't work that way and that as part of an overall diet, it's pretty good, but, but that's about it. Right. Okay. So we're coming up to one of my faves. Because everyone thinks that they're going to give their chicken ACV and it's going to take care of worms. It no. does not. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> ACV, apple cider vinegar, does not have anthelmintic action. And the theory behind this is that the apple cider vinegar raises the pH in the crop and makes it an inhospitable environment for worms. You know, that's a good theory. Because studies do say that in small amounts, no more than a tablespoon a week, apple cider vinegar. Per gallon of water. Right. Apple cider vinegar does add to a chicken's overall health in a positive way, but it will do nothing for an existing worm load. And let's look at it this way. Intestinal parasites. These parasites are living in the intestines, not so much the crop. Right. So, I mean, it changes the pH inside that crop to make things like unhealthy bacteria and fungus and all that stuff. One tablespoon, one gallon, once a week, it's going to just have an overall healthy effect on your chicken, but it is not a natural dewormer. You don't want to use this. It's filled with good stuff. And again, our formula, one tablespoon, one gallon, once a week is really the maximum you should be giving your bird at any time. Now, the next one is one that you have done a ton of research on Mm -hmm. as of late. And Mm -hmm. you really, we find that if you want to go the natural way, this might be the way to go. Yes. Yeah. Now this is black walnut holes. One of the reasons this one is so interesting to me is because here in Maryland, we have got whole forests of black walnut trees. Oh yeah. It's black walnut, but what you want is the green ripe black walnut casing. Okay. So, you know, you think of like little walnut shells, right? With the walnut meat inside, but they're encased on the tree. They're encased in these large, rough green seed pods. Right. And if you break them open, they're filled with this, I guess you would call it meat because it's actually, the, the whole thing is actually the fruit. Right. And so the meat inside has this brown dye that will stain. It's been used as a dye for hundreds of years. So when you tackle black walnuts, it's a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in order to be effective, you need to tincture the black walnut holes. You're trying to extract juglone, which is the active chemical compound in the black walnut holes. They're also very high in tannins. And the tannins also do some magic on the parasites because that level of tannins is just so bitter. The parasites can't survive it. But again, you can go toxic with this. You can go too high. So black walnut has to be tinctured. To extract the juglone, the juglone is the chemical compound that acts as a dewormer. And black walnut also has high tannin levels, and tannins are very bitter. Tannic acid is very bitter. Right. And that also can kill off the parasites. But at this moment, I've been unable to find standard dosing. That's a problem. It is a problem because you can use too much black walnut extract, and it can be toxic to your birds. So the problem with it is finding a standard dose. When I'm doing any kind of a tincture with my birds, I've been using two milliliters per gallon because that seems to be safe. I'm not sure that that's enough to be effective, right? but I'm not going to risk my birds having a toxic reaction to anything that I'm using tincture-wise. I've seen another long-time homesteader using that same two milliliter per gallon dose. Okay. 
Again, we're not vets and we're not recommending that. We're simply saying that this is what we do. You can buy a black walnut tincture. You can make your own. It takes about four to six weeks to make a good black walnut tincture. And it is a really good year for black walnuts. The trees are loaded this year. But again, without the standard dosing, this is this you're doing this at your own risk, essentially. Exactly. I mean, the studies are showing that you can deworm, but there's got to be some more studies. So this is what yeah. we say nature and natural has to team up with scientific because right. you need the studies on the natural products to make sure that they're going to do what we need them to do. Just going in blindly with these things, chickens show you health problems at a rate where you need to treat them and know what it is very quickly. Right, right. So more studies need to be done on this so that we can get a common dosing so that this can be a new type of dewormer that's natural. That would be right. great. Exactly. I still feel that glycerites are the best base for livestock tinctures and Mountain Rose Herb sells a bottle of glycerites for $10. Nice. I have seen others. And again, some longtime homesteaders using alcohol tinctures with their livestock. And on that, I just say, you know what? Your mileage may vary. That is right. your own risk. That's what you want to do. That's your own decision. But out of all of them so far, this is the one that has the studies that does show it does work in a natural way. We just need dosing, which right. would be great. Exactly right. Now, the last is another one that does work. It wormwood. Is wormwood. wormwood. Yep. Artemisia absinthinium. Its antiparasitic action is literally how it got its name. Wormwood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is another one. It works on the nervous system and care must be taken to avoid overdosing. I feel like the natural way you do still have to have education on these products Absolutely. And on, on the natural. They're not really products. They're natural things in nature. You have to be able mm -hmm. to know what you're doing with these right. because it's the old story of don't eat the wild mushrooms because they could be harmful to you. Well, these again, things. it's the difference between digoxin and foxglove poisoning. Right. Trust me when I tell you I've spent hours reading study after study after study on this. The wormwood in particular, thujone is the chemical compound. And a lot of the studies on wormwood focused on using it as a coccidostat. Okay. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. But results were mixed there. There was some definite action on the coccidia, but it was not as efficient or effective as amprolium administered in the flux drinking water. Right. So I feel like that needs more research too. If you have, if your grandmother had a secret, Recipe book with exact doses for chickens with black walnut hole tincture or wormwood tincture. We would love to hear about it. Yeah, send us. But as it is, for now, our recommendation is to stick with chemical dewormers when you know your birds have a worm load. Yeah, the pharmaceutical dewormers are the way to go because... They are proven to work. Now, the resistance can be real, so you don't want to overuse them. You know, you may want to put the natural ones in for prophylactic in the spring and in the fall, those types of things. But when you know that your chicken is sick and there's a potential for a worm load, so you're seeing diarrhea, you're seeing pale comb and waddles and general poor health. You may it, even be seeing round worms or tapeworms in your chicken poop. It's time to use the pharmaceuticals at this point. They need something that works. Safeguard is the one that we recommend. Mm -hmm. It's in the name, Safeguard. It tends to work with kicking the worms out and killing them within 48 hours of dosing. You can see the parasites coming out once you right. get it within 48 right. hours and you know that it's killing them. And it's not harmful to your chickens. Veterinarians, they dose it. The dose that we know of is one cc per bird. If there's a bad worm load, you can give that one cc again in 10 days. And that is it. I give half of that dose for bantams. And half for bantams. So it's very easy. It's scientifically researched. It's been around forever. It works. The natural dewormers can be an excellent part of a prevention plan. Yes. And the studies did find that a lot of them help stop the oocysts and eggs from hatching, and they really go a long way to keeping your flock healthy. So do your research. We're going to link a whole bunch of these studies. Actually, no, they're not going to fit in our show notes. <laughs> I will put an article on our website 
that it's just nothing but these various studies on each one of these natural dewormers so you can learn more about them. I would love it if we got to the point where we were, didn't have to use chemical dewormers unless it was a serious problem because that would really cut down on worm resistance. Right. I mean, and it's the way to go. Prophylactically, if you could do that and not have a harmful effect afterwards, you wouldn't have an egg withdrawal different things like that. Safeguard is a 10-day egg withdrawal after dosing, so it's not crazy long. And but if you have zero egg withdrawal, then that's perfect too. Absolutely. And the thing with Safeguard is, like you said, it's safe. Fenbendazole has a very large margin of safety on either end. You don't want to underdose with it, but like some other dewormers, levomisole, velbazin, you have to be pretty exact with weights on them because they can also have a toxic effect. The problem with underdosing and people do this, and I couldn't stand it working in the medical field with animals so long, is they think that they're doing this great thing by stretching the medicine. Yeah, no. And what you're doing is creating resistance. Yep. So when you give a lesser dose, you're killing just some and not the other. So you're creating that resistance to the drug. Just give the full dose, give it as it's prescribed, and it works. You know, I guess I do have a place in my heart because that's what I did so long is work in medical and pharmaceuticals and know that these things work. Right. But like you said, prophylactically, if we can bring the natural dewormers in once or twice a year and work in conjunction with the pharmaceuticals, yeah. that would be great. If you want to take a week and, you know, crush a clove of garlic and put it in your flocks water every day for a week, have at it. Yeah, it's not I mean, going to hurt There's anything. not a downside to it. It's not going to kill existing worms, but it will definitely stop new worms from hatching. So if you have any questions, let us know. If you have any questions or concerns, or just reach out to us. We're always here to answer them for you. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week, we're trying to hold on to summer a little bit here. The good part of summer. The baking part of summer, right? Yeah. Well, this is perfect. Like summer's still a little warm during the day. This is before we start breaking up pies and cobblers, you know, October. Right. Now, this is basically a multi-step recipe. You can cut some corners. Really, this recipe is for the pound cake. And we recommend that you bake the pound cake. But we are not going to say a word if you buy it at the store. You can also buy the pudding at the store if you want to. Otherwise, you're going to be making our vanilla pudding recipe. You can make both the pudding and the cake a day or two ahead and then assemble on the day that you want to serve it. And you're going to have to buy the berries at the store at this point because they're not in season. A lot of them aren't in season right this moment. I guess but unless you froze some. Maybe you did. Or yeah. so if you go to your farmer's market, you're generally not going to find them. So right. we're going to do three to four cups of mixed berries, you know, or other fruits that you might like. Yeah, you can freshly sliced peaches if you still have some fresh summer peaches. Yeah, you can definitely use peaches in this recipe, but we'll just leave it whatever fruit you want. And then there's going to be whipped cream or dairy-free whipped cream also. And you can do it. We're not going to judge if you buy it or make it, whatever exactly. is easier. Let's do the first step and look at the pound cake and see what you're going to need for ingredients there. You're going to need two cups of sugar. That's a good amount. Now, I'm not going to yeah. go too much more on that. That's a good amount. Well, this, is there. A, this is a pound cake. They're sweet. They're sweet, yep. baby. Okay, so one cup or two sticks of butter or dairy-free butter. It's going to be softened because we're going to be creaming it. Four large eggs, a tablespoon of vanilla, three cups of gluten-free flour, two teaspoons of baking powder for that rise, and a cup of milk or plant milk. And you can just use regular flour if you're not doing gluten-free. Exactly. Now, heat that oven to 350, preheat it. And grease a bunt pan or a two pan. Don't forget to sprinkle it with the flour too. Right. So you, you want a large mixing bowl. You're going to cream the butter and sugar together at about medium speed. You're going to scrape down the sides. You're going to add your vanilla and the eggs one at a time, beating well after each addition. This is really like classic cake instructions. Oh, yeah. In a medium mixing bowl, you're going to whisk together the baking powder and the flour now, in alternating additions, so you're going to do four additions total. You're going to alternate the flour mixture and then the milk, beating just until each is blended in. Then give it a final mix all around to make sure everything's good. Pour your batter in the pan. This is going to bake 50 to 60 minutes. You're going to bake until a tester comes out clean. 
You're going to take the cake out and you want it to cool completely. You can't use Let it that hot. cake cool. Yeah, completely. Once it's cool, you're going to cut the cake into cubes and set them aside. If you haven't already made the vanilla pudding, do that now. Or buy those little cups and then just put a Whatever. whole bunch in the bowl. <laughs> Look, we're not going to judge. Whatever you want to do. So you're going to assemble your trifle in layers. Do you have a trifle bowl, Chris? Yes. I do too. Somebody gave it to me as a wedding. It's beautiful. I love making trifles because mm-hmm. it's they're so pretty and so easy and they look hard, but they're not. <laughs> I like to make a Black Forest trifle at Christmas that's just gorgeous. Yeah, I love assemb- them. They, they're so good too. Assemble the trifle in layers. First layer is the cake. Second layer is the fruit. Third layer is pudding. Fourth layer, whipped cream. You're going to do yeah. however many yeah, however many layers fit in your trifle dish or your bowl. Top it with whipped cream and garnish it with some of the fruit. Chill it and enjoy. It's delicious. And take it somewhere because it's one of those hostess things that you can take and look really great. And you it's easy. Amazing if you show up with a trifle. Who's yeah. going to say no to a trifle? I mean, and that's an Instagram post oh. right there. Hey, you know what? I forgot. I named one of the new Brahmas trifle. Yay! <laughs> so yeah, I mean, these are the things we like easy, but looks really nice. And so try it. You might like it. Send us pictures. We love to see it when you make the stuff. It's awesome. Okay, so this week's retail therapy, we're doing a little something different this week. And there's a little backstory to what we're doing. We got an email from a listener and they had some trouble. And what we're doing is giving their Etsy store a little shout out. So we got an email from Tara, one of our listeners. And unfortunately, she did have a predator attack on her enclosure and it took out her entire flock and they're rebuilding and they're trying to make their coop so secure and just redo everything. And what they're doing to raise funds is they have created a store on Etsy where they are selling they're gorgeous tote bags. And we wanted to give that Etsy store a shout out because I love the fact that they're raising funds, but you get something back. You get to buy a really cool tote bag and the money that you're spending goes to help these chickens have the best enclosure that they can have. Right. She made a product to raise money in order to build better housing for her chickens. I love that. The tote bag, it's a good size tote bag. It is made out of a heavy organic cotton canvas. It features a photo of Carmela, and Carmela is a ridiculously cute buff laced Polish. I love it. She's so Uh cute. That poop, that bouffant is so cute on there. It's a great tote bag that you can use at the farmer's market that you can take shopping with you. Or, you know, if you want to give it to a gift for a chicken lady out there, I love tote bags. I use them for everything. And, you know, I feel like You cannot have too many tote bags. You can't. And when you go shopping, and here's the other thing, there's stores, grocery stores in my area at least, are starting not to give you bags anymore. Plastic Mm -hmm. bags are being abolished. So having these tote bags to go around and go shopping with are amazing. And the fact that I love this because they didn't have the funds. And instead of just going out and saying, hey, give me money, they're making a product that's really cool and selling it. So I love that. And Her little chicken on there is just so cute. Carmela, I love it. I love it. So I have a link to the Happy Farm Brain Etsy shop. It goes straight to Carmela's tote on Etsy, so you can check it out. Check it out. They're so cute. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting a very old and I would say a very underappreciated breed, the Hamburg. Yes. Main topic, we have an interview with the wonderful Arthur Parkinson, all about his new book, Chicken Boy. You don't want to miss this. It was so much fun. Cracking the eggs. We're going to do a good old-fashioned apple stack cake. Because it's September. Apple time. And retail therapy, we're going to be talking about the best cold weather tarps for your chicken runs. Yes, there is a difference between them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page 
patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening. Ha, 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 ha.